Hey everyone, welcome back to The Leadership Project with your host Mick Spears. Our vision is to inspire all leaders to challenge the status quo. We bring you weekly topics and thought-provoking guests to get you to stop, reflect and think about what it means to be a leader in a modern world. Our aim is to help you become the leader you wish you always had as we learn together and lead together. Today's episode is brought to you by my new book, You're a Leader, Now What? The Proven Path to High Performance Leadership. The book contains many of the great lessons that we've been learning together during the Leadership Project podcast, together with many other lessons that I've collected over my 30-year career as a leader. The book is aimed at first-time leaders, but really there's lessons in there for everyone. It would be greatly appreciated if you could go and grab your copy on Amazon as either an ebook or a paperback, and if you could leave us an honest review on Amazon. Now, on with the show. Hey everyone, and welcome back to The Leadership Project. I'm greatly honoured today to be joined by Guillaume Viatre. Guillaume is the principal and founder of MetaHelm, a company that guides CEOs, founders and business owners to align teams and accelerate innovative adoption. Now, here's a key. He is the author of a book called Strategic Narrative, and he puts out a position that storytelling is dead, and now the new champion is this thing called strategic narrative. And that's what we're going to get deeply into as we go today. And I'm sure there's a nuance to this thing about storytelling is dead. My abundant curiosity is firing off in all directions. So I can't wait to get into this one. So without any further ado, please, Guillaume, say hello to our audience and give us a flavor of your background and what led you to be with us today. Hi, everyone. I'm here talking to you from Seattle. And the first thing, you know, that shaped my, my journey as an entrepreneur is my immigration to the United States 13 years ago, actually almost at the same time of the year, you know, towards the, the summer and coming here as a, as a, as a, as a stranger with a, with a broken English in the, at a time where, you know, who needed to, to welcome or hire a, a management consultant in an economy that that is struggling was a, was a really great learning experience for me. And before that, I, I've started companies in France. That's where I come from, obviously. And uh, I continued this entrepreneurial journey because my, my passion in life is to help create more businesses that are meaningful. In fact, I have a mission, which is to create more businesses as sources of inspiration that few can resist. And that comes from, again, from my own experience starting in life working in companies and environment that I was expecting to be more full of joy, but that we're not designed for that. <laughs> and that, that creating a, a, a big appetite and a thirst to change, to change that one company, one business at a time. And, 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 and very often time, do it by design when we start the company. So now, many years later, I run a boutique strategic consulting firm called MetaHelm. And yeah, we specialize in strategic narrative and we help uh, CEOs, we help founders, we help business owners, no matter the industry or no matter the size of the company, we help them figure out ways to build companies as movements. That's, that's a good way to summarize it. Companies that are, that are focused on a mission that really brings everyone along. Ch changing the definition for what competing might mean, actually turning competition very often time into allyship. Because I work with people who also believe that our world is facing challenges that will probably require less competition and more working together. That's one of the themes that always comes back in my work is this theme of gathering and mobilizing people together. So, Mick, that's what I do. That's where I come from. And, and I'm just so excited to the years to come because I think I have still so many things to discover and to learn. Congratulations on your success. First of all, uh, Guillaume, you've helped a number of different companies to reinvent themselves. 
including some that you rescued during the dot-com boom, et cetera. So well done. There's at least two things that I want to unpack in terms of what you've already discussed with us. And I want to start with that first one, which was when you spoke about meaning, you spoke about inspiration. There are a lot of companies out there that when you ask them their purpose, it's all about, oh, it's growth and make more money. You're talking about meaning and inspiration. Tell me what that means to you, Gail. To me, meaning and inspirations are evolutive. They may change. They are not set in stone, right? Because that's who we are as human beings. We are, we are, we are the, the result and we are participants of evolution. And I have always noticed that we tend to think of organization and businesses as things that are rigid. And, and we have this tendency, the aspiration to, to kind of get things set in, in place. And we say, yeah, what's the purpose of this company? Well, we have a purpose statement and we've spent a great deal of time and energy crafting it. We hired a very expensive agency and our leaders did these retreats. And now it's set in stone. It's there and it's there for, for good for forever. And I believe that we need to, to rethink that a little bit. We need to, to see this as, a, as, a, as something more evolutionary. So first of all, meaning, inspiration is, I, I, see, I picture this more as something that is probably closer to an energy <laughs> mm-hmm. than just you know, a feeling, an energy, something that is dynamic that you will see, that you will notice as you work with your colleagues, as you serve clients. As you come up with new ideas, new products, you can feel it. It's in the room. It's in the voices of people, in the body language, and in the creative process that we put together. Mm. That's what that's what meaning and inspiration is for me. Yeah, really good, uh, Guillaume. And uh, certainly, we have to acknowledge that we live in an ever changing world. And Mm -hmm. for the last few years, you would say that that change has been constant and increasing, right? So it's it's just always changing. So those companies that are able to adapt and evolve their purpose are the ones that might emerge here. What positive impact do you think comes with the company that's able to pivot away from, let's call it growth for growth's sake, having true meaning and inspiration and being able to have that in an adaptive or an evolutionary type of approach? Well, the number one thing, Mick, is that they're more successful. They work better. They're even more profitable than those who are not initially just and directly focused on growth and, and profit. It's so interesting. I was talking to the founder of, of a company who does uh, recruiting in the Bay Area uh, last week, in fact. And he was telling me how, and, and they, by the way, they, they work on, based on those principles. You know, they're, they're highly adaptive. They believe in evolutionary purpose. He told me that at the beginning of COVID, in the first few weeks, so March, I think it was March of 2020, as all of his competitors were firing people, you know, shrinking, were were kind of collapsing because they were were stuck in their ways. They were stuck into, this is what we're designed to do. and, 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 And we really have to force trying to do the same thing. His company actually pivoted extremely quickly. And in the same period of time, you know, the COVID period, his company grew 600%. 600 percent so so first of all the number one impact is more agile companies more sustainable companies companies where it's it's easier to work and and that survive longer and if you think if you look at the stats you know what 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 we're what we're seeing over the past 20 25 years the the lifespan of companies has drastically changed don't quote me on this i i don't have the numbers right in front of me but you you can research it's very easy research to do but the, the lifespan of average companies, data is about a thousand people, is now, you know, has shrunk significantly, significantly, because the way we, we've designed companies is not adapted anymore for the way the world works anymore. So that's the number one positive impact is companies that, are, that have a higher performance. And then the, the other facet of it is, I would say, and that's what I'm most excited about is seeing companies that are designed for the get-go to have a positive, you know, by design to have a positive impact on what they are trying to do versus companies who say they have a positive impact and fall into the traps of greenwashing and, and trying to say that they bring something good to the environment just for marketing reasons and fake reasons. That would be the second biggest reason for me is these companies are designed to change the status quo in a way that makes things very positive. So here, here are some examples. Uh, Charlie's Chocolonely is a 
Dutch company that creates, uh, that produces uh, cacao. And it was actually launched by a, a journalist who was investigating on uh, how cacao is uh, actually, uh, the raw material is produced and, and realized that a, a significant uh, share of how we make uh, chocolate on this planet is is through uh, child labor and, and slavery. And although the, the companies who most big, biggest chocolate companies claim that it's not happening because they have standards that are antiquated, mm -hmm. uh, it actually does happen. And so he went on the mission to uh, change that and to make the supply chain, the way they process the raw material, the way they, they manufacture it, the way they produce it, complete tra completely transparent to people. So that's the kind of company I am talking about. And they are becoming one of the number one chocolate producers in the US market, uh, in Europe for sure. They're actually producing raw material for big brand chocolate chocolate makers who, who now wants to get to start, you know, playing the same the same way, I would say, you know, in, in a more sustainable, more with more integrity. So that that's one example. Another example we have here in Seattle is a is a pizza chain called Mud Pizza. It's mostly a US based company, a very high growth. Mud Pizza started in 2008, founded by by a couple who couldn't find really good food options for their kids and thought there's no, you know, there is e either when we're on the go, we can feed our, our kids fast food or, you know, the local, uh, maybe uh, Mexican uh, taco truck and not so many options. And they decided that they wanted to create a pizza place that would serve people. What they meant by this is serve in terms of customer service in terms of healthy food, but also uh, serve the people who work for them. And what does this mean is that they start, it started hiring, you know, offering decent jobs, jobs that were available for people who would not normally uh, find a job opportunity, like, like former convicts, people who were seeking for a second chance in their life. Today, this company is everywhere in the United States, uh, about to go public, uh, just started with an international presence in the UK. I can only imagine they will grow even uh, better and healthier and has completely changed the way one may think about a pizza restaurant. So these are the companies that inspire me and these are the companies I want to help build and, and, and make. Those last few words were really powerful. These are the companies that inspire me and that's the ones I want to help. So we'll come back to that. I want to summarize a little bit of what you've just said. So the companies that are focusing on a true purpose and meaning are being more successful than the ones that focus on growth themselves. But it has to be a true purpose and meaning. It can't be just a statement that you put on your website or a plaque that you put on the wall. It needs to be something that you live and breathe. It also needs to be adaptive because the world is changing all the time. Then all of the examples that I heard you use, uh, Guillaume, were examples where that purpose and meaning had some level of ethical application or some kind of social responsibility. Where do you believe values and beliefs of the company come into this? Well, they're, they're, they're core. It's, it's, uh, it's central. I mean, those companies are... Uh, interestingly, they make the way they set their values uh, their number one competitive advantage. Mm -hmm. That's that's the that's the reason why that why they, they they exist. Your summary was spot on, and that's they start with an idea. Where they start with with an idea, and an idea. <laughs> Sorry for my accent. They start with an idea and an idea, right? And they look around what the need that what the world needs first. Number one, not what they need personally, ju not just what they need personally. But your, your comment here on, on purpose made me also remember that I think that uh, the fact that companies who are purpose-driven are work better, I, I, th I think that's a, that's a pretty commonly accepted idea now, by now. And, you know, it's, we've talked about this for, for a while now. I think the new challenge is how do we make this work today? How do we change the way we we view typical organization? You know, pyramids. You know, the 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 typical metaphor for a company is a machine. You know, a company has you know like where you we have key performance indicators and and our processes are 
are are built in a way that is smoother and, and more. And so how do we turn this idea of purpose into very practical, uh, actionable things on a daily basis? How do we make decisions that are truly based on our purpose? You know, if we have a pur purpose statement on the wall, you know, written on the wall in the boardroom, and we're making these strategic decisions here, how often do we turn to that purpose and say, yes, our decisions are actually in favor of that statement, but that requires a different kind of leaders, different kind of mindset. A thousand percent. And I think we're, we are getting there. Like people in this, this dialogue is happening. People are seeing that purpose and meaning is important. Yep. And they're seeing that congruence with that purpose and meaning is what people are looking for. Not the greenwashing that you spoke about before. Yeah. 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 The reason why I wanted to pick on those words that you said that that pizza company, a pizza company inspired you, Guillaume. Now, what I was picking up, you use the word inspire and I want to help. But I heard in the language that you're using that you're attracted to that company as a consumer mm -hmm. because you go, yeah, I, I believe in what they believe. They're there to serve me. But then you also said that they serve the people that work there, mm -hmm. inspire people that want to help. So this you know, 600% increase and these, these companies that are making the most of this purpose and meaning and getting out there and telling the world about their purpose and meaning and living by it. The reason why they're being successful is a, they attract customers that believe in the things that they believe. They attract talented people that want to work with them mm -hmm. that believe in the things that they believe. And they attract people like Guillaume, who is a management consultant who wants to help them on their mission, right? So when you're out there and you can state with clarity what your purpose and meaning is, and for that purpose and meaning to be ethical and socially responsible, you're going to attract customers, you're going to attract people. And when those people arrive, because they believe in the mission, they're going to work on the mission with their heart and soul, not just for the paycheck. Mm -hmm. How does that sit with you? It sits very well. I mean, I'm listening to 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 your words. I'm like, yeah, this is this is I 100. percent You know, I I resonate with that, and that's what I called alignment. You know, yeah. but and that's and that's why I, I my 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 book strategic narrative tries to explain, and I I do that visually because I I represent alignment with arrows, right? Mm -hmm. I I drew arrows in my book and say, okay, when we are aligned, we all all the arrows go in the overall the same direction. We're never perfectly aligned. That's that's a lie, <laughs> but we overall go in this in, in a direction that feels like okay, there is synchronicity here and there is congruence. I agree with you. You've got to walk the talk. So mission, inspiration, and meaning are not just things you put on paper, right? It's also what you do on a daily basis, how you treat your colleagues, how you treat, how you treat your, your team members, who do you hire, what kind of decisions do you make when it comes to sourcing material, place A or place B. You know, and you're confronting with with tough choices, and 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 that is to me that is the true meaning of alignment is that it goes beyond uh, the internal side of a company. It goes also outside. And one of the reasons that I, I went to explore this and, and wanted to 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 define what this means is that I've seen too many companies uh, really pick up on this concept as very shallow marketing tactics, and and one of them is storytelling. And as you said, you know, I I. I and I claim it, I believe the traditional, and I would add traditional business storytelling is dead. Yeah, I, I do believe that. I, and what do I mean by this? It's like we, we discovered, you know, about 10, 15 years ago that, yeah, look, guys, you know, there is storytelling and it's going to help us create our marketing and it's, it's going to help us sell more stuff. That's really what it sounds like. And it sounds like all of a sudden business storytelling became the new branding. You know, the same thing, but just with a new buzz term. Yeah. And, and storytelling is so much more than this. So mm -hmm. the reason why I say that, you know, traditional business storytelling is dead is it because I think we, what's dead is really, it's not the art of storytelling. So, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm a big advocate for the true art, the authentic art of storytelling. What I am against is the rigid mindset of being stuck into thinking that, one story that has, say, five elements is going to be the magic recipe to make everything work well. And that's what most business storytelling books you will pick up in an online bookstore will, will try to tell you. 
uh, I, you know, I did extensive research on this. Uh, for those who can see us on video, they are here right behind me on my bookshelf. And, and so that's the pattern I see. And I'm like, okay, this is, this is, um, it's, it's, be, it's really outdated now. We've got to move on. We, okay, we, we got it. You know, storytelling is human. Storytelling is super powerful. I agree with all that. But it can't be just a fixed recipe that you apply. Uh, and once again, just like, a, this, just, like, just like a machine, right? It's something that is a lot more deep than that, something a lot more complex. And so in doing this research, I, I came to the realization that good leaders don't tell one story. They have a narrative. And there is a difference here. People will gladly pay for a story. Yeah, you can buy a book, you can go watch a movie, or you can go on somebody's website and you'll, you'll buy into a story that a brand wants to tell you. you. You can buy into this. But what really makes people stand up and mobilize and take action are narratives. And narratives are different. You know, we say the narrative about, 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 about society, the narrative about economy, the narrative about leadership. Narratives are systems of story. They are made of many, many, many different stories. And when you build a true narrative, when you have a movement that is built on a true, powerful, meaningful narrative, what you've done is that you've meaningfully associated stories together. For instance, you came to uh, explore the origin of how your company started and, and, and why it started. And it's so striking to me that too many entrepreneurs, too many business leaders haven't done that work, that essential work of going back in time and say, why did we actually decide to, to build that company? Why, why in the first place did we want to do that? Or it could be at, at the product level, at the service level. You can do that with a project, with a team. You know, Go back in time and explore the core DNA of why a group of people decided to get together and work on something. And you'll discover that, that this is already the center of several stories because each person comes with their own story. So it's a lot more complex, a lot more deep than just saying, okay, let's tell our story. You, you will hear that all the time. Let's tell our story. You don't have a story. You have thousands of stories. And you have to orchestrate them. You have to make them more coherent. I'll pause here because I see you. I see you nod, and your body language is telling me you've got stuff to to say. <laughs> so, much, to say. so much to unpack there, Guillaume. That was amazing. First of all, well done. And I want to connect some dots. So you said this a moment ago. You said story of stories, and then if I go back to purpose alignment, mm -hmm. and you were talking about arrows, mm -hmm. and you were saying that those arrows might not all be pointing exactly in the right direction, in the, not the right direction, in the same direction, in the center, but, they're, yeah. but they're in the general direction, right? Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. one of the things about finding purpose, and there's a lot of people out there that are trying to find their purpose. In fact, some people get purpose anxiety. They, they, right. Everyone's telling you, you should have a purpose. Yep. And, we've, and we've got some very young people that are getting you know, anxiety about it, which is, there's a way of breaking that, by the way, but you know, let it come. It will come. It'll, it will emerge for you. But what I heard with the alignment is when, when someone says to someone, you know, what is your individual purpose? Some people struggle with that going, well, I work for the company and the company is this purpose and they'll recite the company's purpose, but they won't have a good connection with their own purpose. But what I'm hearing from you is it's a story of stories. So here is this individual that works in a company and they've got a purpose here and yep. overall it aligns to the bigger mission of the company. Is that what you're saying with story, not story alignment, purpose alignment? I just want to be a little more accurate. I say the system of stories. Ah, system. It's a, it's, it's a system. Of, so think about a system of stories because they, they, they connect together. Some are, uh, like, you know, yeah. more. Okay, so I, this is getting technical here, but I think really about it as, as a system. And so, yes, I agree with you. Purpose anxiety is a big problem. <laughs> I, I I had purpose anxiety for a while, many years ago. Yeah, I, that, I, I this was my problem. Like, okay, what am I doing here? I was really soul searching and couldn't connect. And so my way, of, and I, I didn't have a coach. No, no one helped me with that at the time. My way of solving it was just to stop wondering about this and just doing work and, and just going with, with my intuition and doing work where I felt like my heart was happy, <laughs> was beating, was beginning in a, in a more healthy, uh, healthy way, to be honest. So started doing uh, odd jobs. Uh, I'm, I'm also an artist and a musician. So 
started, you know, playing more music and I could pay, I could pay them my bills with that. And it was, that was fine. And that's how I really reconnected to my roots. So back to our conversation here, it's, it's okay to be in a spot, I think, where you, you, you live in an organization and you feel like, okay, maybe, and I said arrows earlier, because I, you know, if people are vectors, you know, a company is the sum of all vectors, we all produce a direction and an intensity, right? And it's okay to slow down at some point and say, where do, where is this ship going? And do I still want to be on this ship? Do I still feel like I'm, I'm, I'm heading the right direction? Or is it okay for the ship to, to carry me for a little bit here and just kind of take a back seat? And is there a chance I could do that? Is that a load in this culture and this, in, in this organization? And maybe I can do that for a little bit and then make a decision and, get, and say, yeah, yeah, I, 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 want, I want to continue. I want, I think this is the right direction or I want to influence, you know, with my own, with my own purpose where, where this thing is going. So that is all beautiful. That's all ideal. I would be, it would be dishonest to say that this can happen everywhere. It's not true. It has to happen in the right type of environment where just like the example I was, I was using earlier, the CEO came to, you know, the CEO with the 600 growth, 600% growth uh, during COVID, you know, he didn't decide this on his own. He actually turned to his, as uh, I think there are 700 employees, he turned to his seven employees and say, what do we do with COVID? I don't know, guys. I'm just like you. <laughs> it's not because I'm the CEO that have better answers. You guys may have thoughts here, or you you can tune into your purpose and tell us overall where do you think we should go. And what did they do? They decided to come to 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 be actively involved into COVID testing and helping their communities, and that's how they save their organization. So. I, I, I want to check that I'm answering your question here because I felt like I went on a tangent. But. No, you did, but it was a good tangent, right? So, yes. and I love the analogy and the metaphor of the ship. Yeah, you got the people on the ship that are able to influence the direction of the ship. The mm -hmm. ship lives in an environment, a changing environment. The ship needs mm -hmm. to adapt as conditions change. And I love the example that you have where the CEO gave people a voice, listen mm -hmm. to their opinion, and say, "Right, we're all in this together." What are your ideas? And, and gave them that platform. And they'll develop deep ownership of the result then because they feel yeah. like they've got their, their say. And it is okay to sometimes just sit on the ship and go, yep, I'm, I'm still learning. I'm still emerging. Just let the shift, ship go and I'm going to go on the ride. And there's other times to influence the direction and speak up. And yeah, really good. Okay. And, and that's one of the things, you know, I, I talk from experience here because that's one of the things I've been coaching people, you know, executives or, or, or managers or even individual contributors in companies is how do you let go of the sense of control and how do you invite people to participate? Mm -hmm. How do you let people have their fingerprints on a, on something that is as big as crucial as the whole company business strategy. So one of the principles we have at MetaHelm is really the principle of co-construction, the true co true co-construction, really, really do, doing it at a deep level. And so that that takes courage, that takes effort, because you have to let go of your preconceived ideas that that this is just pure collective game. There's still a room for somebody to facilitate. There are roles that can be assigned for this to work well. Yeah, I love the whole thing of co-creation and creating that environment where everyone can bring their superpower or their gift to the table and then holding space for them to be able to bring themselves to the table and contribute yeah. to creating something that's greater than the sum of the parts, right? Yeah. Mm. By the way, that's another difference between stories and narrative, mm. which you're describing right here. Yeah. When you... You know, sto stories, we say, if you look up the definition of stories, even, or we, we tend to think, oh, yeah, it has a beginning, a middle, and an end. So it's closed-ended. You know, there is a resolution within this, with the story. The, 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 typical, um, uh, the typical framework for storytelling is the hero's journey, uh, heroes face his struggle, and finally find a way. I'm just sim oversimplifying here for the purpose of this conversation. And then there is resolution. The hero saves the day or get, gets better or... or, or anyhow a narrative is always open-ended we don't know the end it's future focused yeah. so that's that's another reason why you have to bring people to help you get to that potential end i like to explain that because as you described that's it only works if you give room for people to participate that's how you create excitement that's how you create inspiration and meaning is people are invited and, and invited to participate so you have to create room for that 
I woke up this morning getting ready for this interview, knowing that I was going to learn something today and okay. I'm not disappointed. This is amazing. So now <laughs> what I'm hearing is the narrative to use some of your own words, but I kind of tend to twist it into my words as well. But to hear this narrative, I'm hearing that it's a collection of stories. You, you said yep. system of stories. So it's not a story, it's a collection of stories. And there are players in that story. Everyone playing their bit. There's characters, there's roles, there's different things. But then I'm also loving this open-ended part. And you've got me instantly thinking about Simon Sinek's work on the infinite game. Mm -hmm. Business doesn't stop. It's, it's not, okay, it's, you go to a movie and a movie is 90 minutes long, two hours long, whatever it is, and you go home feeling great because the hero won in the end. Mm -hmm. Business needs to continue the day after and the day after exactly. and the day after. So the yep. narrative is continuous and it yep. has its origins. Mm -hmm. uh, you spoke before about getting back to the roots. Why did this, we start this company again in the first place? And that's part of the narrative. And then yep. we had this chapter in our life. Then we had this chapter, then this chapter. And there were, there were different players that came into our world and then left again and then others that came in and they all served a purpose. For once, I'm understanding what a narrative is, I think. But you tell me. Yeah, you know, it's a uh, look. I am a researcher. I am. A, I'm a creator. I am. Um, I, I try to shake the status quo a little bit. I'm trying to put forth in front of people, and that's why I'm here. I'm excited to be on this on this podcast. Is like I'm proposing a new definition, an evolved definition that may be of use. Is it a true definition? I don't know. I don't think so. You know, <laughs> models typically are, are not true, but they are useful. I see day, you know, every day in my work. It's helpful. It's useful to think like that. You know, well, is this is this a guaranteed recipe? No, not at all. I mean, strategy is just what's the definition of strategy? Strategy is about making hypotheses that yeah. you're going to go test and see if it's going to work. So that's why it has to be open ended. I I want to make sure that also this conversation doesn't stay at the just a conceptual level, which is important, but also gets very practical. When I look at a company's narrative, I typically look at around 40 to 50 different, depending on the size and the type of companies I, I, look, I work with, I look at about 40 to 50 different items. And I look at the coherence between those items. And these, are, those items may be of three types. Typically, they are, they are leadership practices. So really behaviors, what people are, you know, principles that people will follow. Uh, such as, are we able to speak about the elephant in the room? You know, does our culture allow for that? You know, do we walk the talk? I look at tools that companies may have put in place. Sometimes it's very, very concrete things, such as feedback loops and surveys, but also pieces of communications that I believe are essential to to build good narratives. Uh, and I look also at the performance because this is all, all again, in the spirit of making companies run better. So, you know, we look at, Things like business models. How do we generate revenue? Are we de are we are we marketing dependent or not? A question like I asked this question like, would your company survive if you stopped all marketing budget today? People stare at me like a dare in the headline. Like, what do you mean? <laughs> That's that can happen. Well, I can show you uh, in some areas that it could work really well. Like, if you if you have a narrative that is powerful enough that it drives people to want to work with you, want to buy from you. Maybe you don't need the same kind of narrative. Maybe it's, it's not paid, uh, the same kind of marketing, sorry. Maybe it's not so much paid marketing that tends to fake the growth. It's a different kind of growth. That's what I'm trying to say. So I think that's a good opportunity to step back a little bit into the storytelling. And then I want to work back to how does a company get started with this transition to narrative, right? So in the storytelling, I want to share what I picked up from what you were saying before. What you had me thinking was, it depends on why you were telling that story in the first place. Mm -hmm. And people are very clever. And if you sat around in the marketing room, the boardroom, the executive table, whatever, and you were dreaming up stories with the sole purpose of selling your product, growing the company, making more money, then that's cynical. That's cynical storytelling and people are going to see through it. Whereas if, and forgive me for using the word storytelling again for a moment, but storytelling slash narrative, yeah. if the reason was to get out there and to tell people with deep clarity who you are, what you do, why you do it, who you serve, what problem you solve, 
and why it's good for the world, what you're doing is you're looking to attract people that believe in the things that you believe. It's not cynical anymore. Yep. So is, is that the difference between story and narrative? That's a major difference in, in the reason why you would want to use both concepts. Yes, that is, that, is, that is one of the biggest differences. I would, I would add to your, to your definition of narrative is not just what you say, but also what you do, which is also another difference. People think of storytelling as an act of literature. Let's yeah. write our story. Let's craft. Pay attention to the words. Let's craft our story. Let's, let's tell our story. Let's write our story. And I use purposefully, let's build our narrative. Narrative are socially constructed. They appear through actions. If yeah. you look at uh, movements, you know, do they have big communications budget? No, but they have tons of people doing things, you know, going, going outside, knocking on doors, mobilizing, uh, finding solutions, grassroots. How do we find food? How do we procure shelter to people? How do we change the way we do education, health? People do things. So na narrative is a lot more about doing. Uh, storytelling has been, and that's why, again, I think the traditional kind of commonly accepted today is like it's a, you have to be a good writer. And in fact, when I, 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 I speak at conferences or at companies, uh, you know, I, I, people tell me, I can't do this. I'm not a good writer. And I say, perfect. You don't need to be a good writer. You need to be a good leader. You need to look at your practices. So, okay. So some of the leadership practices are very much about communication. Absolutely. But it's not just that. It's how do you walk the talk again? So that's when you're in, into, into narrative mode. Okay. The word that's popping into my mind now is intentionality, right? So why am I telling this story? If you can answer that question with clarity, then we're getting somewhere, right? So if you're telling a story because someone told you that telling a story is powerful and it influences behavior. Like the typical thing, people say, if you're going to do a presentation, yeah. build it around a story. And then someone tells a story that's got no connection whatsoever to any exactly. kind of intentional purpose. There you go. So, so that's right there. That's what, that's the first, I, I ran into this issues, issue consistently, consistently several years ago. I'm like, okay, that's the problem with storytelling. We tell everyone to tell stories, but he has no, no connection whatsoever with what we're trying to do here. Mm. We're not building a system. We're building a quagmire of story. We're building chaos. Yeah, very I represent this visually in my book. I put a diagram together that always catches people's eye when they see on the left the, the spaghetti ball of stories. And it's all like kind of a mess. <laughs> it's, 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 it's just uh, chaos. And I'm saying, okay, no, we, why are we telling those stories? Like, what's the intent? What's the intentionality? So completely agree with you. Well, I want to ask another question now about the narrative. And because we spoke a lot about you, you gave examples of why did we start this company in the first place and all this kind of stuff. How do you make sure that the narrative is not self-centered, that it's relatable to the audience that you're talking to oh. so that they can see themselves in the story not just, oh, yeah, that's an interesting company, but I can see a better world because of that company and I can see myself being part of that world or it helps me in some way. How do you make sure it's not all about me.com? It's all about the world and the people that we serve. It's easy. You shut up and you invite those people in the company, in the room to tell their story. That's it. Okay, now let me, let me expand here a little bit. Uh, and he, I'll give you an example of a client I have uh, that happened two years, about two years ago. And at first, they're trying to make storytelling work. And I, they, I, they brought me on. And I see exactly what you're saying here. It's all self-centered. Our mission, our purpose, our vision, our products, like us, 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 me, 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 me. <laughs> it's a strategy selfie central. <laughs> it's all about us, us, us. us. And I say, have you, what, when, what's the last time I, you, you've talked to, to your customers? Well, we talk to our customers every day. I mean, when's the last time you have really listened to a customer? You've really taken the time to really understand what they, what they, where they go through. And so, they, they, I, I challenge them to to bring to bring some of the customers in and and really let them give them some space and ask meaningful questions, spend some time, and re really being in empathy with them. 
and so w- that's what we did. And customers are such a powerful uh, engine for alignment. You know, empathy at a deep, deep level. When you when you ha- when you work with somebody you're trying to help, that typically you don't. I mean, you you think you talk to them on the phone or via email, or you may run into them very quickly for the purpose of delivering a product. But when you really spend quality time and empathy, empathy time, you know, empathetic time together and really go go at a at a at a deeper level that you find so many great answers. So but that requires you to be silent. That's why I say you shut up. <laughs> you listen very, very carefully. And so with this company we went it went so well that one of the it's a it's a technology company. They they're a B2B company. One of their clients asked them if they could work with them. And he's now part of the team. And that's the, the it's it's a critical asset to really have someone who was a former former client who's who's really able to remind everyone every day that we're 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 here not just to serve the company but we're here to serve a community. So we have uh, with with that team we have a we have a joke you know we say are we really wearing the customer's hat? <laughs> so we had little hats made <laughs> with a label customer on it, and we wear those hats in meetings sometimes. Nice visualization then. Yeah, nice like visualization. It. There's another technique that I've, 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 uh, that's, it's pretty uh, commonly known as to leave. If you, if you, if you have a meeting or wh- whatever you do, you do a gathering and you leave an empty chair and you say, this is, this is who we serve. This person may not be physically here, but, but that's her spot. That's her place here. And so we can, we can see it. So we are always reminded that. We are all here working in the spirit of helping someone who's not physically here, but is actually really important to us. Loving this level of uh, deep yeah. empathy that are here and the practical examples of how to that's that's, that's how. And also, you know, what, um, and I want to I want to give other other tips or other very practical things to do here. It's learning to observe within the environment of your company. So uh, sometimes I'll do that for my clients. I will read their emails, read their what they write listen to their conversations and tell them how they sound company centric versus community centric and and i and i i even count words so i do this you know i take a look at their website sometime and say how many times do you w- use the word you or the word we <laughs> and sometimes like none like it's all about us 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 there is there are different methods to to uh, to to actually measure this i could even provide quantitative data. I've seen it countless times, uh, Guillaume. It's absolutely true. And what I'm hearing now, we've got the empathy and now we're hearing that the narrative is not just about the company, it's about the world that they live in. So it's it's about the people inside the company, it's about the company, it's about the customers, it's about the impact they have on society, on the community. It's a full narrative and that's why it's not a story. Yeah. In the way I, I look at, I help you know people develop this narrative, I say, okay, you have... You, you have a part, uh, there are four dimensions uh, in my approach. One is really about you individually as a leader. One is about your team. One is about your, your, your client, your customers. But the fourth one is about your community. Another synonym for, for this dimension is uh, ecosystem, which is a word that uh, seems to be more and more accepted, more used. We, we, we finally realize that we live in an ecosystem, like uh, on, the, on planet Earth, we actually are part of an ecosystem. So kind of nice to, to accept that and integrate that idea in the way we build and, and develop businesses, right? It's when you, when you have a company, don't forget you're part of an ecosystem. And if you start, if you've not respected that idea, you, you, it, it will backlash. <laughs> you're part of, a, of an environment where you connect with others outside. All right, that's a key learning, I think, for everyone out there. So have a look at, and I'm sorry for using the word story for a moment, have yeah. a look at the stories that you're telling and, and who are they about. And if they don't have these four dimensions that Guillaume is talking about, you're not telling the full story, full narrative, right? So the leader, the team, the customer, and the community that you live in, really powerful. All right, so there's going to be a lot of people out there to be really frank with you, uh, Guillaume, they're going to be out there going, scratching the head. We've been training all of our sales and our marketing team about storytelling. And, and now Guillaume is telling us that we need to shift gears and we need to tell a richer narrative. How do they even start when they've been investing their, their time and effort in story building? First place to start is, like I said, is look at the overall picture for your company. 
do a quick audit. I apply something that is very systematic. I have my own favorite 40 to 50 items because I've been doing this for many, many years. You don't necessarily need to, to go that far. Look at things, make a list of, uh, of, say, you look at your website, you do a couple of interviews with some team members and, you know, go meet a couple of customers, have a look at how your meetings are running and really be in listening mode and step back, ask a few open-ended questions like very simply, what, what do you think is the greatest thing we deliver to the world or to our clients? Tell me about your day. How does your day, you know, uh, unfold? Very simple questions. You can start there and then get that information, put it on paper, print it, put it on the table and see if you see a common thread. Do you see any commonalities, any common points, anything that stands out? It could be one word, it could be one sentence. Try to start there. And that tells you if there is the start of a narrative. It could be that this narrative is the right one, good for you. I mean, what I mean by the right one, meaning it is the narrative that you intentionally you know, design or wish that the company would, would, would carry, or maybe it's the wrong one. Maybe you will learn that despite all of your efforts, everything that is happening in your inside and around your organization is actually going in a direction that is not exactly where you wanted this to go, right? So you have to to do a little bit of look at look at this in the look at yourself and, and the company in the mirror and say, okay, do that reflective exercise here. Sometimes it can be uh, you know as simple as if you still have a printer somewhere because I know people don't use printers so much <laughs> anymore. But one very easy practical exercise is pick 10 documents, 10 things that you feel like would represent, should represent, you know, what your business is and print them and put them on the table and, and look visually what do you see. I, I do that sometimes. And, and many times people tell me, well, yeah, these are 10 things from 10 different companies, right? And I say, no, this is you guys. So right there, start by taking some distance. There's a good metaphor, a metaphor that I like is that if your if your company is a group of people dancing, you know we say we're, we we dance the same thing because we're actively working. Move away from the dance floor, you know the daily grind and the busyness, and go a little bit on the balcony in that room and look at what's happening. That metaphor is not from me, by the way. It's from Ron Had, Ron Heifetz, who the, is a great you know thought leader on change management and adaptive leadership. And he says, go on the balcony. And look at what's happening here. Do, we, do you, What do you see? Do you see coherence? Do you see movement? Do you, do you see synchronicity? Or do you see just, just a mess? Do you see people fighting, tensions? Do you see people leaving because they've had it? So start yeah. there. Observation and diagnosis, number one. There's a few things I'd love to add here, Guillaume, and get your feedback on. So uh, what you were just sharing on, we call that uh, second position and third position um, look, oh. right? So, I'm learning something. So when you uh, when you look in a mirror like that, or you look through someone else's eyes, you might be sitting in the customer's shoes and looking back at the co- uh, the company. That would be second position, and okay. that balcony of the dance floor. When you look above like that, and you're seeing everything, because then now you're actually seeing when you're looking from the dance floor, you're not just looking at the interactions of your team. You're looking at how does the team interact with the customer in the outside world. Right. That's, that's called third position uh, thinking. So yeah, really powerful stuff. One more on that one, and a really important one that it came from our interview with Charlie Feynman, and I'm going to repeat it now. I want everyone to realize this, is that your brand mm-hmm. is not what you say it is. It's what other people say it is. So unless you take these second and third position looks that Guillaume is talking about, you don't know what other people are saying about you. You're just believing your own rhetoric your own message right so get out of your own shoes start taking a second position and a third position look and see how your company is looked at from the outside and something might emerge for you there and you might not be happy by the way you might look at it and go oh that's how people see us or you might be delighted and there's congruence of yes that's exactly what we want but take that look right well i'm hearing I, i love that concept i didn't know that concept of second and third position but what I'm what I'm hearing, Mick, is very much it's very much about making sure that you frame the situation correctly. Yeah. You can't rush this, right? You have to to step back and slow down, and make sure that you're diagnosing what's going on first mm-hmm. thoroughly until you you have a good picture. You should really really keep listening, observing. 
Very good. And then the second one I wanted to come back to, Guillaume, is you mentioned about looking for the thread. Look, what is common amongst all of these 16 documents that I've got on the table, et cetera? I thought that was really powerful. And what I want to add with that, with emergence of purpose, that when you find that common thread, start doing a bit of sensitivity analysis on it. So these are the questions I'd recommend that you ask. What would happen if we stopped doing that thing? What would be the impact? Would it be catastrophic? Would it be would be letting thousands of people down? What would happen if we stopped doing that? What would happen if we did more of that thing? Mm-hmm. You know, ask yourself these challenging questions. Once you find that thread, is that thread the real thread? And do we need to double down on it? Do we need to stop doing that because it's not serving us? It's not serving us and it's not serving others. So I think once you find that thread, you need to challenge yourself on that thread. How does that sit with you? It's, it's great because it reminds me of a question I typically ask in my own uh, diagnostic phase, which is, yeah, would the company be missed if it disappeared? It's one of the questions I ask, you know, when, when people want to see if they, if they can provide value. I, like, let me ask you some questions here and get a sense for your level of awareness, yeah. you know, where, you know, and so I, I love that. I love that question. What would happen if we stopped that or if we, you know, if, if we discontinue this, we, yeah. yeah, if we stop this way of working, for instance. Yeah, really good. Okay. Now, I want to circle back to something that was in the very first minute of our conversation. And okay, what I is it? Didn't, didn't get a chance to ask you at that point. So I want to bring it up. You brought up something really interesting. You spoke about not thinking about competition and thinking about allyship. Tell yep. us more about what you meant there. I was born, I was going to say born and raised. <laughs> I was, yeah, actually I was born and raised. My, I, I come from a family of entrepreneurs and the topic of competitors, you know, would come very often in the conversations, you know, even at the dinner table with my, uh, my grandparents used to run this uh, button factory in the garment industry. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, and they're like, oh, our competitors are doing this are doing that. And so it creates that, I uh, created very early on in my mind that metaphor, that war metaphor. You know, we're competing. We have, or if we don't do this, we're going to die. We have to defeat their strategies and tactics. You, if you pay attention, the the, the metaphor for war is very present. You know, uh, and and the business community really enjoys the the book. You know, the Art of War by Sun Tzu because it it really resonates for most business leaders. But there are other ways to think about our ecosystem and to say. You know, there is an abundance of ideas. There's an abundance of technology. There's an abundance of possibilities. Do we really need to fight against each other? Like if another company comes into my market and start doing the same thing, that's actually flattering, number one. And number two, am I so out of ideas that I can't produce something different? So that leads me to think that in general, in most cases, better off going to your competitors and turn them into potential partners and allies to create better value together. Mm-hmm. I, I think, you know, I, again, I'm not trying to evangelize the world to completely change. I can't do that, but I'm just, I'm just putting a word and a message out there for people to rethink the way they, they look at competition and find more potential into allyship. I ask the question very often to my clients or, or, or inter- successful entrepreneurs I meet and say, gosh, you've got this wonderful process and would you be, you sound very excited about it, very passionate about it. Would you be one day, would you consider going to you, who you consider being your competitors and teaching them about that? Because it's so great. Look, look at how much health, let's say I'm working with somebody in healthcare. Look how much, how healthier you make your clients, right? If it's really true and it really brings positive impact to the world, why don't you share that technique? with with competitors not as easy as that of course i know there are constraints but maybe a little bit of that mindset sometimes help we've seen it during covid we've we have seen pharmaceutical companies who traditionally fight against each other like animals you know get together and say can we can we figure this vaccine thing together okay we'll we'll make deals we'll we'll make we'll sign agreement and partnerships but is there a way we can change the way our humanity works here? Because we have a, a problem larger than, than ourselves. So I do this all the time. When I run into somebody who says, hey, we do strategic, I'm not the only one doing strategic narrative. Other people do it. And I'm so excited to find them. I pick up the phone and I go talk to them. Say, how do you do this? Look, I do it this way. How do you, you do it this way? And 
Sometimes they don't want to talk to me. That's fine. But most of the time they do. And we find that we're actually better off chatting together. So I, I just really want to, you know, I, hopefully that message resonates with our audience here. It's like, revisit the concept of competition. You will, you will find that in our world, it's, it's starting to get, it's starting to change definitions. It's, it's, it's shaping, it's, it's, it's evolving differently. So Guillaume, so uh, we can talk about competition now. Great. So how do we call these competitors? I call them mates. They are niche mates. They are category mates. They are neighbors. They can absolutely live next to you or be in the same city, the same market, you know, segment as you. And they, they have the right to leave as well. And you have the right to learn from them and to give them something. Do a little bit of a IP potluck one day and try it out and yeah. see what this means. You know, a potluck in English, I learned that term because I it's not from it's not French at all. <laughs> we like we like formal sit-down dinners. <laughs> but bring 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 food to the table and share it with others. And you'll see that it brings people together in a way that uh is just unbelievable. So I love the abundant mindset. Love yeah, this. this is really, very much. really powerful. And even using your own business as an example, where you you were learning from and with your, let's call them traditional competitors, but they're your mates, your allies, and you want to change the world. You want to change the world towards one where people take on strategic narrative. Mm-hmm. You can, you've only got so much impact yourself, but when you join together, you can co-create and collaborate and create an impact that multiplies the impact of what any one of your competitors could do or you yourself, uh, Guillaume. And the pharmaceutical one was a great example. I believe that companies are better positioned to change the world than most governments, right? They're more influential, they're more powerful, they've got more levers to pull, they're not constrained as much with with governance and, and with let's call it what it is, the political game, et cetera, et cetera. So when we combine together, we change the world is the first thing. And the second one is the whole scarcity mindset versus the abundant mindset that when we do get together and we combine our strengths together, we grow the pie. We don't slice up the pie. So even if you take a pure commercial look at it, it's not about slicing the pie into ever smaller pieces. It's about increasing the size of the pie because you've got greater impact by collaborating together. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I mean, that's, uh, lo- I love the metaphor with the pie. Yeah, that's, that's the idea. it grows. Yeah. One plus one doesn't equal, equal two in that context, equal three or more. <laughs> yeah, brilliant. All right, thank you so much, Guillaume. That brings us to a close. I couldn't let that statement that you said very old uh, go without uh, wanting to explore it a little bit more. So thank you. Yeah, for yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm very excited about this topic. I could, I could take, talk the whole day about competition. Yeah. <laughs> All right, so I want to come to our our closing four questions. So the first one, uh, what's the one thing you know now that you wish you knew when you were 20? I would say so many things. <laughs> but I would say one one thing is that potential is not something you maximize. Hmm. Potential is unlimited. We do hear that term a lot. Maximize your potential. Keep maximize going. your potential means yeah, it's it has an it has a cap and end. And uh, when I was a when I was younger, I thought I was picturing myself going to a certain level and staying there. And I, that was my definition of success. Explore your potential, not maximize your potential, but explore because I think it's endless. And um, I learned that I think a little a little later in my career. I'm, I'm I'm almost 50 now. To you know, full full disclosure here, and I wish I, I had learned that. I wish I was I was educated with that with that idea. But I was educated in, in a different, in a, a great environment, by the way. Awesome education. But that that's something I wish somebody had opened my eyes about. Yeah, nice. Okay, what's your favorite book? My favorite book is a book by someone called Austin Kleon. He defines himself as a writer who draws and he writes about creativity. And if I can cheat a little bit here, it's a set of three books. I would call it a three-part book, but in three books. The first one's called Steal Like an Artist. The second one is called Show Your Work. And the third one is called Keep Going. And they're wonderful, punchy books. I like punchy books. In that same vein, there is a great book uh, called Rework. Rework is also, what I mean by punchy is the very bold. It has very, uh, very salient point of views. 
I've not read that trilogy that you're talking about, but I instantly thought about the very conversation we've had. It's um, very graphic too. Lots of drawings, uh, yeah. short sentences, and key principles you can use very nice. easy. Okay, what's your favorite quote? Okay, another tough question. I am a quote hoarder. One of the quotes I have really loved lately is, if you feel like you're hidden, if you feel like you're in the dark, it's not because you're forgotten, but it's because you're growing. I'm probably butchering that quote. But Send it to you after the show. <laughs> All right, we'll do that and we'll put it in the show notes. That's a good yeah, idea. But that's, good. Yeah, that's really cool. And finally, how do people get in contact with you if they do want to make this shift to a strategic narrative? You could uh, connect with me on LinkedIn. That's very easy. I'm always active on LinkedIn. Or if you have a web browser handy, you type in the URL uh, www.strategicnarrative.com and you will land on my company uh, webpage and you have all my information there, my articles, my videos, and my uh, free to download ebook. It's not gated. You don't have to give me your email. It's okay. Brilliant. You can have it for free, really for free. Brilliant, Jim. Uh, I love it. Thank you so much for everything today. And we'll put those links in the show notes as well, including your LinkedIn profile. It's been such a pleasure. I knew I was going to learn something today and I was not disappointed. And I know that the audience would have learned a lot today as well. Thank you so much for your time. I equally learned a ton. Thank you so much for creating that space, Mick. Brilliant. <laughs> Today's episode was brought to you by my new book, You're a Leader, Now What? The Proven Path to High Performance Leadership. The book contains many of the great lessons that we have learned together here on the Leadership Project podcast, together with lessons that I've collected over my 30-year career as a leader. The book is aimed towards first-time leaders, but really there's something in there for everyone. If you would like to show your appreciation for this show, we would greatly appreciate if you were able to go and get your copy of the book on Amazon as either an ebook or a paperback. And if you could leave us an honest review on Amazon. Thank you for listening to the Leadership Project podcast at mixbeers.com. A big call out to Faris Sadek for his sound design and editing of our audio and video content. And to the whole team at TLP, Joanne Goes On, Gerald Calabo, Rika Vadanes, and my wonderful supportive wife, Say Spears, who is also our operations manager. This show would simply not be possible without you. If you've enjoyed the show, please leave us a rating and review at Apple Podcasts. You can catch the video podcast and our video of the week at the Leadership Project YouTube channel. And you can join the conversation at the Leadership Project Facebook community group. We look forward to bringing you more great content and interviews next week as we continue to learn together and lead together. In the meantime, please do take care, look out for each other, and always remember to challenge the status quo.